start looking at the life of Joseph, one life's impact. And the daily decisions you make, little small everyday decisions impact generations of people. But the thing is, God is bigger than any person's decisions. It doesn't matter. Joseph's brothers sold him out. Joseph's dad had a favorite son. All those things led to Joseph being sold as a slave. But you know what? God was in all of it. He was above all of it. He was above every single person's decision. And so we talked about last week, remembering that your day-to-day -day decisions, they impact generations. But God is bigger than anybody's decisions. And so today, I, I just have two main things I want to get across to you that, from God's Word and the story of Joseph. And I'm going to give them to you at the beginning, in case I run out of time or somebody jets out early, all right? But here's the deal. This is the main theme through all of the Scripture that you see in Genesis chapter 29. But it's two ideas. And, and it's this. This really links into what's going on with Joseph. He's been sold as a slave to Potiphar's house. And so I want you to think about this. The, the, the place that you may view as a detour, sometimes that's God's destination. You may be like in your mind thinking, I, I'm in this bad place in my life. This has to be a detour around where God wants me to be. This isn't where God wants me to go. This is like a detour around somewhere God wants me to go. And I, I want to tell you that there's times in life that are struggles and absolute difficult places. And it's not the detour, it's the destination. And in the middle of those places, our tendency is to cry out, God, change my surroundings. And you know what? Sometimes God says instead of changing your surroundings, He's going to change your standing. He's going to leave you in the middle of it, but He's going to make you different. Instead of improving your circumstances, sometimes God just wants to improve you. In the middle of the harsh circumstances. And that was the case for Joseph. He's there. He's in the middle of this horrible situation. He's been sold as a slave. His brothers have abandoned him. His father thinks he's dead. And he has these great dreams that the Lord has given him. And he's wondering, is this ever going to come true? And he could have gotten bitter at that moment. He could have cried out, God, change my circumstances. But that's not what he did. God changed him instead of changing his circumstances. I want you to get this idea. Number two, write this down. Whenever you step out in faith to make an impact for God, you have this embracing of a target on your back. It's a target for trial and temptation. You know, uh, there's a lot of preachers today that talk about the favor of God. Uh, and mostly it's just so that they can line their pockets. I mean, it, it's, it's because they're scam artists and they think, they, they try to make this lie that, you know, for if you really love God, you really step out in faith, man, you sow your seed, you do all these things, then God's going to bless you with His favor and you know what's going to happen? You're going to get a bigger, better house and a bigger, better job and a bigger, better bank account and your spouse is automatically going to look different than the way that they look now and you can eat whatever you want and you're not going to gain a pound and you're going to get this unbelievable life. And I want to say that's exactly what happened for Jesus, right? No, it's not. The favor of God led him to the cross for us. That's not what happened for the Apostle Paul. It's not what happened to any of the disciples. Whenever you step out in faith, you have this unbelievable ability to make an impact that lasts for generations, but that comes with embracing a target on your back. A target for trial and for temptation. And see, here's the deal. Sometimes the way that God works is not to pull you out of the trial or to stand back and say, no, this person is not going to be tempted. Sometimes it's to preserve you in the middle of it. To preserve you in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the temptation, and to show I'm still God over you. That's exactly what happened with Joseph. Look at his story. Now, when you get home today, go back and read Genesis 38. Genesis 38 and Genesis 39, they, they're partner passages. And so one talks about his brother Judah, Joseph's brother Judah. Uh, it was his idea to sell Joseph as a slave instead of him killing them. And so, uh, so he sold him as a slave with the rest of the other brother's approval. But this talks about how Judah gives into temptation. He has a chance to avoid temptation and he does it. He just totally gives in and it shows the outcome of his life. But then you see Joseph and how he fights against temptation. He has this target on his back. Look what it says, chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. That's so important. He could have been bought by anybody. Think about that. He could have been bought by anybody, but Potiphar was the chief of the executioners of Pharaoh. That, that's like uh, a powerful person. And he had access 
to a specific jail. And that jail is exactly where God wanted Joseph to be later. Look at what happens. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Here's this guy. He's this slave boy. He's probably 18 years old, 17 years old at this time. And he's there in Egypt. And this guy buys him and he takes him home. And he notices there's something different about this guy. This guy is great at everything. Remember his dad saw the same thing. That's why he was the favorite. And so here's what Joseph decides to do. Instead of getting bitter at God, instead of being bitter at his brothers, he says, I'm going to work for Potiphar in the same way that I would work for God. I'm going to do everything that I do as I'm doing it for the Lord. And any credit that I get, I'm just going to reflect back to God. I'm going to build his reputation instead of building my reputation. And Potiphar looks at this guy and he says, I don't even believe in that God. But there's something about that God. He causes a difference in people. Look at the way this guy works. Look at how he's succeeding and what he's doing. There's something different about this guy. There's something different about his God. And he looks and he identifies Joseph's success with God's blessing. What would happen if every person, every believer in America lived like this in jobs that they hated? If every single person who just, ah, oh, it's just a drudge every day to get up and go to my job. What if every single day you work that job just like you were working for the Lord? And you were so good at it and so incredible at it, you got all these heaps of praise. And instead of taking it for your own and saying, that's right, I am the best. You know, and, and instead, of, you just reflected the glory back to the Lord. It would be the biggest witness in America you could possibly have. Look at what happens. Verse 6. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. Because of him, he had no concern about anything except for the food that he ate. I love it. He, he, he doesn't just make Joseph his chief slave. He makes him in charge of everything. He's his financial advisor. He's his bill payer. He's his analyst. He's his investor. Every single thing. He just says, Joseph, here's all my stuff. Here's my books. Here's my bank balance. Here's everything. Here's the bills and stuff I got coming in. Here's the plants that we're going to plant in the fall. Here's all that. You're in charge of everything, Joseph. And his only decision was, what am I going to eat today? Wouldn't that be nice? That was the only decision you had? You know, like everything else was just covered? That was this guy's life. Look at what it says. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He was a stud muffin. He was one fine hunk of man meat. Alright? He was like every guy you see on The Bachelor except he had a brain too. I mean like everything, right? And he was a godly, godly man. I, I was outside uh, in our little small garden with my daughter the other night. And she was trying to stay up later. So she wanted to butter me up. And so she comes out and she's just like going like this. You know, my five-year-old. And she says, it's such a beautiful night outside, isn't it, Daddy? And, uh, and I said, yeah. And I thought, well, here's a chance to build her up. And I was like, well, it's even more beautiful now that you've come out here. You know, just, just trying to encourage her and let her know that God's made her beautiful. And she looks back at me and she says, well, it's even more handsome a night because you're out here, Dad. <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right, if you would have said that about Joseph, that probably would have been true. But, you know, me, I don't know. I think she's just trying to stay up late. But he was a stud. I want you to see what happens. Now listen, remember, when you step out for God to make an impact, regardless of your circumstances, you have a target for trial and, and temptation on your back. Wait, what is that? After that time, his master's wife cast her eyes on him, on Joseph, and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He's put everything he has under my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself. Because you're his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He says, Look, listen, I, I'm not falling for the bait, catfish. Like, get out of here. Like, I'm not giving in to this deal. There's more than meets the eye going on. L listen, you want to talk about a detour. You're the one who wants to detour what God's got going on. There's an enemy who's after me, and things are going well, even in the midst of horrible circumstances. I'm still working for the Lord. I'm reflecting all the glory back to Him. And there's this target on my back of trial and temptation, and I'm not giving in to you, woman. And here's what he knew. All temptation, all sin, there's no such thing as a private one. You realize that? There's no such thing as a, 
a private sin between you and somebody else. He knew that ultimately every sin was against God. He says, how could I do this? Now, he could have been in a place where he's like, I'm an 18-year-old boy. I'm a bundle of hormones with skin on, baby. And I look like this. And this woman is coming on to me. And you know what? Uh, I, I deserve to be happy, don't I? I mean, God made me with these feelings and these legitimate sexual needs. And they won't let me take a wife. And so here's this woman. And I'm being her husband anyway. I'm in charge of the whole household. He just decides what he wants to eat for dinner. This is not right. And he could have given in. But he didn't. He viewed it as this target on his back. He said, I'm never, no. This would be against God. But you know what? Temptation very rarely has a one day expiration. Look what it says, verse 10. And so she spoke to Joseph day after day. And he wouldn't listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Day after day, he's gearing himself up every single day. I know temptation is coming. I'm making an impact for God. There's a target on my back. This woman is trying to take me down. And so he was ready. Are you that ready for temptation every single day? Are you ready for temptation because you know it's coming? Or are you just blindsided every time you just give into it, right? Look what it says. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, none of the men were in the house. You think that's an accident? Or you think that's an attack from an enemy? And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled out of the house, she called to the men of the household, now they show up, right? And said, see, he's brought among us this Hebrew to laugh at us. He came to me and lie with me and I cried out in a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and I cried out, he left his garment beside me and he fled. And he got out of the house and she laid up the garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story. The Hebrew servant whom you brought among us. He came in to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and I cried. He left his garment beside me. And he fled out of the house. Do you realize something? Look right here. Um, you can be completely holy. And you can avoid temptation. You can flee temptation. You can fight against temptation. And there's times where you're still going to face consequences. Because we live in an evil world. And he did everything right. And there's this mindset in Christianity today. Oh, I do everything right. Life's going to be check plus good, right? And that's not what God says. Sometimes He's not going to change your circumstances. Sometimes He's going to change you in the middle of the circumstances. Sometimes He's not going to change your marriage. He's going to change you. And then later He'll change your marriage. Sometimes He's not going to change your job. Sometimes He's going to change you in the midst of the job. And then it's going to be a completely different world for you there. You see it? That's what happened for Joseph. Look what it said. Verse 19. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. It's, uh, it's uh, fire was lit. That's a bad thing when the chief executioner's fire is lit. Right? Look at what it says. Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. What would have happened if somebody else would have bought Joseph as a slave? If he would have committed this act or been accused of committing this act, he wouldn't have gone to the king's prison. He would have been in a completely different prison. This is the king's prison where only the king's prisoners, the personal prisoners of the king were kept. Listen, this is so important because what did we say last week? God is bigger than anyone's decisions. Here's the deal. God knew there's going to be some people that have some dreams and they're the king's prisoners. And Joseph, you need to be there to interpret them. Because then one day, Pharaoh's going to have a nightmare and this official that you interpreted the dream for, he's going to remember it and he's going to remember you. And you're going to have the chance to stand before Pharaoh and interpret his dream. But that never would have happened if Potiphar hadn't bought him as a slave. We would have said but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the prison released him. Right? No. Listen, it, 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 God didn't show him favor by saying, you get out of the circumstances. He gave him favor by saying, Joseph, you go the, the same exact pattern. You just do everything like you're doing it from me. Regardless of your circumstances. It doesn't matter your marriage, your job, any of that stuff. You just live your life like you're living it for me. And even if your circumstances don't change, I'm going to change you in the middle of it. Even if your surroundings don't change, I'm going to change your standing in everybody's eyes, Joseph. And so God's favor was with him. And he rose to the top of success in the prison. 
Verse 22, the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done, he was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. You know, how many of us would have had a pity party? But Joseph, no. He said, this is my life. God determines my circumstances. If he doesn't change him, he wants me in him and wants to change me. And so I've got this target on my back for trial and for temptation. And I can let that alter the way I live or I could keep making an impact and still have the target. And I'm going to choose to live in the impact and still have the target. That's what he said. And God was faithful. And he saw the hand of God at work. What about you? Are you ready for temptation this week? Uh, are you ready? Uh, are you making an impact enough so there's actually a target on your back? Think about that. Are you ready that no matter what temptation comes, temptation with your mouth, temptation with your eyes, temptation with your thoughts, whatever it is, that you're ready to fight the battle? Listen, you can be. This week, uh, our challenge is simple. When you came in in your uh, little bulletin, you got six red dots. Those are bullseyes, all right? <laughs> Now, here's what I want you to remember. You have a target on your back. When you step out to make an impact, this is what we're doing as a church family. We're making our mark. We're taking the culture God's developed in here, and we're spreading it out in our community. And so here's the deal. You are a target for trial and for temptation. I want you to be ready. And so here's what I want you to do. This week, you have six bullseyes. And I want you to put them on whatever tempts you the most. All right, so some of your spouses are going to be walking around with like dots everywhere, right? Because it's like, you make me so tempted to be angry and destroy you, right? I mean, now, now here's what I want you to do. Seriously, um, here's a couple ideas. Maybe you want to put the bullseye on the TV. Maybe just, that's a huge time sucker for you. And just waste your time. Instead of spending time with the Lord, instead of being in community with other people, you just, you're turned on the tube and, and it's a time waste. Maybe it's stuff that you watch. Maybe it's your computer screen. And when nobody else is around, you're tempted. You know it's a temptation. And nobody else knows it's a temptation for you. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's a coworker. You just go and stick it under their desk. And then every time you walk by, you're like, that's the spot right there. That's the temptation, right? And I... I'm, I'm going to stand strong this week. Here, here's one for me. My mouth is a temptation for me. And so I've got a big bathroom mirror. Every day I brush my teeth right there. And so I'm going to stand there today, this afternoon, and I'm going to look in the mirror and I'm going to put the dot where my mouth is on the mirror. And every morning after I get out of my shower, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm going to look, and it's going to remind me I have a bullseye for my mouth. Satan's going to tempt me to blow up in anger at my kids or to say harsh words to my wife whenever something goes wrong or whatever it is. Or, and so I'm ready. And so here's what I want you to do. You can put all six out today. Uh, some of you need to wait till work tomorrow. <laughs> do it. You can put one out each day. Whatever it is, what I want you to remember is that you have a target. And God may not change your circumstances, but He wants to change you in the middle of the circumstances. And so on Tuesday, I'm going to email out the top temptations and verses of scripture to help you combat those. And so you're on your own until Tuesday. So pray up, read up. But I've got a great list of scriptures. And so on Tuesday, make sure your email address is on that response card. I'll email it out to you. And you can use those to fuel up and be ready every single week. Let's make an impact and make our mark. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and praise you that you're the God of the universe. I thank you that you're here among us. And Lord, right now, your Holy Spirit is convicting us of sin. Areas in our life that we just give into temptation without even thinking about it. And Lord, wherever your Holy Spirit brings conviction, I just pray that your people right now would just repent of that. They would confess it. And they would say, Lord, it's yours. This week, Lord, I pray that you would help us not focus so much on our circumstances changing, on our surroundings changing, but how you want to change us in the middle of the circumstance. God, I pray that we would work, that we would live just like we're doing it for you. Regardless of our circumstance, we would reflect all glory back for you so you improve our standing, so you improve us. And God, when the target is on our back for trial and for temptation, Help us remember you are bigger than anyone's decisions. 
you were working out your plan. You're developing us to look more like Jesus. And you don't always withhold the temptation from Satan for us. You, sometimes you let him come and you let him tempt us. And that's okay because you want us to be ready. Sometimes you don't withhold the trial. Even when we're faithful and we avoid the temptation. Even when we flee and we're holy in that. Sometimes we still face the trial. But God help us to remember you're in charge of our circumstances. And so Lord this week as we have the target on our back. I pray we'd be faithful. I pray we'd be faithful like Joseph. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen.